Hello and welcome to today's webinar, How to Desuckify Bad User Experience with VDI and Desktop as a Service and Minimize Risk. Today's webinar is brought to you by Nutanix and produced by Actual Tech Media. Before we get started, there's a little bit of housekeeping we need to cover, just a few things you should know about today's event. First off, we want this to be very educational. We want you to learn as much as possible about DAS and about how it compares to VDI and get all your questions answered. So we encourage you to use the questions box there in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. We also uh, want you to know that we will be announcing the winner of the $300 Tango gift card at the end of today's event. So make sure that you stay tuned for that. If you're watching the event on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. Uh, prize terms and conditions can be found at events.actualtechmedia.com. And with that, I'm, uh, my name is David Davis, uh, Actual Tech Media and uh, V expert and author, and I'm excited to be moderating today's event. It's going to be a great topic. Uh, we have a uh, really expert in the industry, uh, been on, um, I've interviewed many times before in the past. Uh, that is Mr. Ruben Spite, senior technologist and former Frame CTO. Uh, now of Nutanix. Ruben, thank you so much for being on the event today. Yeah, great, thanks. I'm looking, really looking forward to, uh, well, to share insights and hopefully answer some, uh, some interesting questions as well. So great. awesome, thank yeah. For having me. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you for being on again. So, you know, before we jump into it, I want to first just let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Sure. <laughs> let's sure. review, you know, what are you going to teach us today, Ruben? I know you're actually, uh, uh, traveling right now, you're you're giving a class, and I know you're going to do a little bit of education today for us on desktop as a service. So, what are we going to learn? Yeah, well, different things. So, one of them is well, how to desuckify bad user experience with VDI and that, as you mentioned. Um, also, talk about what is desktop as a service and what are the differences between virtual desktop infrastructure VDI. Um, talk about Nutanix and VDI and DAS. What we do in that particular space, how Frame and Nutanix Frame makes desktop as a service easy. Um, let's see what else. Ex um, share experiences around Azure, AWS, GCP, some performance benchmarking I run myself, and share these results with you so you can use them for DAS or maybe like Frame DAS or maybe other DAS platforms as well. And well, let's spend some time with uh, like what's it like for users. Uh, to use DAS in the real world. So many different things, some technical things, some less technical things, some conversation. So pretty relaxed about that. Uh, we know each other for a longer time and it's good to good to chat. I see there's like a very like interesting chat to talk about the passion I have about end user computing, VDI, desktop as a service and in general end user computing. That's what I that's what I've been doing for a long time. Um, active in the VDI, DAS server-based computing and user computing space for, for many, many, many years with Citrix and VMware and Microsoft and NVIDIA, AMD, um, third-party tools. So happy to uh, to share more insights as well in this, uh, in this meeting. Excellent, excellent. And one thing I've learned about you is uh, I feel like it, I can ask you anything when it comes to VDI and desktop as a service and you just give candid, honest answers. And, and I really appreciate that. And so I want to encourage everyone out there in the audience, if you have a question uh, during the event, during the presentation, just ask it. And we'll yep. be doing a, you know, a Q&A at the end. Um, I also want to dangle out there for everyone. I know Ruben has a special code that will help us to, uh, dis to um, evaluate or test, test drive uh, frame desktop as a service for ourselves uh, that he'll be sharing at the end of the event. Is that right, Ruben? Yeah, I will. Uh, we, we created an, a code to unlock NVIDIA GPUs for the test drive, which means you can you can try Frame for free, no credit card needed, just like a small process. You fill in email address and uh, you generate your own password. You fill in the code. It will unlock NVIDIA M60, a beefy M a GPUs in in public cloud. You can onboard your own app. You can see the admin experience. You can see user experience, and good to go. Yeah. Nice, nice. All right. Well, I look forward to that. Yep. So. You know, the first question to kind of kick it off, uh, I wanted to ask you is, you know, why do we need to suckify bad user experience with VDI and, and desktop as a service? 
I mean, what's wrong with VDI in your opinion? Is is it broken, uh, or is there some reason that people haven't? You know, we we keep saying this is the year of VDI, this is the year of VDI, but for many companies, it it hasn't been so far. So, yeah. is there something wrong with VDI? No, no, there's nothing wrong with VDI and nothing wrong with desktop as a service. Like the end goal of both VDI and desktop as a service is to deliver Windows apps and desktops or Windows components, could be plugins or even secure browsers to anyone who wants to use these, uh, these applications and components. So there's fundamentally nothing wrong with VDI and DAS. It is part of the toolbox to deliver apps and desktops, um, but when not designed correctly or when not communicated correctly, uh, when you don't meet the uh, requirements or when you don't meet the expectations, then it can be really bad. And um, yeah, I've seen it myself in the, in the past. Um, user experience is really bad. A friend of mine, Benny Tritch, um, he is uh, so, somewhat like the, like the, the creator of the, of the title, uh, like Desocify Bad User Experience. And why he created this title together with a couple of other friends is because he is developing software to really measure user experience. Because often we in IT, like including myself, we look at telemetry data uh, generated by systems and try to correlate that data to, okay, what does what the user experience look like? Maybe we should take a look at that differently and really look at what the user really is seeing from his screen and maybe capture that and use that plus telemetry data to determine if user experience using VDI or desktop as a service is is good or bad so yeah it's it's not good or bad it really is like and that's the consultant in me i need to design it well you need to communicate well you need to make sure that the expectations are met and that is not only technology that's also a lot of soft skills and teamwork with other teams inside and outside the company so how to solve it is an interesting question and i already mentioned that briefly it's focused on me and me is not ruben or david but me is the consumers of the service we deliver. The business consumers is what I call them. I understand the why. Why are they interested in delivering? What, 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 understand the why. So why do they need certain uh, functions or technologies? Um, how can VDI and desktop as a service help? And VDI and desktop as a service is not the holy grail. It's not the only uh, solution, not the only answer. It's part of a tool set of uh, solutions. An important tool set, in my opinion, um, but not the only tool set. I understand the application landscape and the impact it has on backend systems. The best user experience is when you get is, is when you bring apps and data close to each other. There's nothing rocket science about that. That's what we do for many, many years. But sometimes people forget, and especially with public cloud, like hey, if you extract app and data and run app in public cloud and the data is on-prem and you have a very poor network connection between those, that will have for sure huge impact in user experience and that will have very likely have a bad user experience. So application landscape, um, teamwork, not silos. So IT and HR and business owners, we need to work together. Um, how to desuckify bad user experiences, keep things simple. Uh, less is more. Sometimes start small, small. That's also the beauty of desktop as a service. You can start, for instance, just with five users for one month, see how things work. Um, Use GPUs, graphical compressor units, where, where possible. Not only for graphic intensive applications, but also more and more of the modern OSs use GPUs. More and more remoting protocols, like Frames Remoting Protocol, or VMware's Remoting Protocol, or uh, Citrix Remoting Protocol, leverage GPUs for encoding. Um, and also, like, finally, measure user experience really well. Maybe with new tools, different tools. Um, different vendors or in this space, like Control Up or Uber Agent or Liquidware or uh, like RD Analyze or Remote User Experience Analyzer, the different, different tools which have a different, different view on measuring user experience. I think these things combined is how you can de bad user experience. Yeah, you make a great point there. I mean, I was a, a Citrix admin uh, for many years and, and I was in that position before where user calls and says, hey, my applications are running slow, and you look at CPU and memory and maybe disk yep. and say, no, everything looks good. I don't know what the problem is. Um, so you make a great point. Focus on the end user and, and their real user experience and find ways to measure that. Um, and I know that 
a lot of people still might be, you know, relatively new to desktop as a service. They might even be relatively new to, to VDI in, in some ways. Yep. Um, so let's talk about, you know, just desktop as a service exact or uh, to to give everyone out there a, a kind of an introduction to to DAS. What is it in in your opinion or in your experience, and how is it different from VDI? Yeah, that's a good a good question. So to really simplify it is like DAS is VDI made simple, so customers, partners, many service providers can focus on core, which is applications, users, integration, and focus less or no focus on the infrastructure to to run like these desktops um, what, I, what do i mean with infrastructure well all the like components normally uh, set up by experts by gurus by people who are knowledge who are, have knowledge to set up brokers and uh, load balancers and gateway and image management and maybe user profile management and being analytics and like all these sort of plumbing behind the scene, which is super important to design, and it's an art to design it well. And there's nothing wrong with that. That art is very, uh, it's a great art to have. But desktop as a service is, okay, now deliver that as a service. That's what desktop as a service is. So the focus is still delivering Windows apps and desktops or Windows components as part of this service, the same as VDI. The, the core is like deliver Windows apps and desktops as a, uh, uh, as, as a core component. But don't need to worry about the like infrastructure uh, behind that. That's the core. That's the core message about desktop as a service. And if you look at this uh, at this slide, um, this slide is like a slide I use a lot in the Nutanix frame context, but applies also to to not to frame, but to other like DAS DAS players. Often it is like three layers, sort of layer layer cake. So the first one is the infrastructure as a service. And that infrastructure as a service means the machines, the virtual machines, the workload machines to actually run the applications and desktops. So if I run Photoshop or if I run SAP or if I run, run Silverlight, these Windows applications need to run somewhere. And in the frame contact, that can be on-premises using Nutanix with AHV or can be in public clouds, Azure, Amazon, Google. So that's the infrastructure. And the desktop as a service is the control plane, the broker. And the infrastructure and the DAS service are like connected to each other. Many customers want to use their own subscription, their own Azure, Amazon, Google subscription, or want to leverage the, the, the Nutanix platform. And that infrastructure then will be connected to this desktop as a service. And this desktop as a service, as I mentioned earlier, manage and handles all the like logic behind the scenes, capacity management, image management, uh, user profile uh, containers, um, uh, different APIs, uh, orchestration, like uh, load balancers, secure gateway services, like these kind of elements. That's what the desktop as a service is. And then, then this blue line is important to separate because in the frame context, so I'll talk about the frame context. So the, in the frame context, we, like Nutanix Frame, will not install, license, configure, or update the customer applications. We make it very simple for the customer and the customer can be enterprises, businesses, many service providers, ISVs, like different customer types, but they are responsible for installing, configuring, licensing, updating their applications. Um, so they have all the flexibility to make it happen. They can use code, whatever tools and processes to make it happen as well. If they want to use SCCM or Chocolate T or PowerShell or manual installation or AppV or ThinApp, whatever they want to use to make, to define, to, to configure and to manage that workspace we are able to support that scenario and of course the desktop as a service layer the middle layer makes a lot of things very very simple so that's why i mentioned earlier that is like vdi made simple um, in the frame context the frame cloud backplane the control plane the broker um, has multi multiple functions uh, and launchpad a web interface a dashboard for administrators the broker um, cloud connector service, IS orchestration, like many things are in like behind the scenes in this control plane. You don't need to worry about that. That's the service we operate. Uh, it's, a, it's a service you subscribe to. You, you can pay per month or pay per, per year or what, whatever fits for the, for, the, for the business need. And then this control plane can communicate with IaaS APIs in Azure, a, uh, AWS and Google, or in the context of Nutanix HV, Nutanix on-premises, 
can communicate with Nutanix on-premises through a cloud connector appliance. And then the users, as you can see on the bottom, can communicate through a streaming gateway appliance, like a sort of secure gateway appliance, if they work from home or in an untrusted network with their VDI, or when they work in the office, they can also work with, uh, with the virtual apps or virtual desktop as well. So Frame is really born, uh, like my, my Nutanix acquired Frame a little bit more than a year ago. And when Frame started roughly seven years ago, the design criteria is, okay, let's, let's do things differently. Let's build a service from the ground up as a cloud service, as a multi-cloud, multi-tenancy, simple to consume, API-driven approach. And that's, like no vendor will, will say, we have a complex, city to use solution. No vendor will say. Um, but if you really look at the solution and, and try it yourself, that's why the test drive is also so, so keen, you will see that Frame is a different desktop as a service approach, different than like VDI is or different than other DAS services are, because you really see it is like, like mature, it is um, polished, it looks great, it is simple to use. There's no six day training to go course to get started with Frame. And like, of course, every vendor will say we are simple and easy to use, but the proof is just try it yourself and then you see how things work. And that's why this test drive is also available. So multi-cloud, on-prem and public clouds, um, simple to use. The only thing we require on the endpoint is a browser. So the user can use just any HTML5 browser, no clients, no agents, no plugin uh, re required to access CPU-based apps, high-end graphics applications, uh, client-server applications, standalone applications, like all, if it runs on Windows, you can run these apps through desktop as a service uh, using, uh, using Frame. And that's also on the admin side, and multi-tenancy is what I mentioned. Uh, multi-tenancy can, can be applied on many levels. So it's really multi-tenant by design. So it applies to many service providers and enterprises. Um, I can uh, mix and match different cloud subscriptions if I want to use different, different, different cloud providers uh, in the same organization or in different organizations. I can separate test acceptance production. I can use multiple regions. Maybe I'm more project driven. I want to create a new account based on projects. I can use different identity providers like, like Azure AD or Google or Okta or, or Ping, SAML based, OAuth based providers on different levels. But still, and still, this, this maybe sounds a little bit complex, but if you see the interface and how it works, you still like, wow, this is indeed very powerful. And that's like because we designed it from the ground up with multi tenancy and robust access control from in, in, in mind. So that's, that's like the, like the, I would say the core message, uh, what I would like to share here. So Frame is extreme simple to use, browser from the endpoint, uh, high-end graphics, 60 frames per second, just using a browser, um, cloud storage integration, cut and paste, microphone, audio playback, um, yeah, special keyboard combination like Alt-Tab or Escape key, even in the browser, these kind of things are really great. And from an admin experience, like admin experience, very simple to set up, multi-tenant, you can use your own subscription, or you can use our subscription if you want to do so. So really simple to, to do. And to me, when people think about desktop as a service, they think about you know running a desktop in the public cloud and paying for it for every minute you know that it's on. And there might be uh, some scary uh, you know fear around that. You know, th just thinking about end users. Well, I have all these end users, and you know, I don't know how long they're going to leave their desktop on. Um, and that's one of the things I like about you all is you have this tremendous flexibility where you can run the desktops in the public cloud if you want, or you can run them on premises uh, in yeah. your own data center. But even if you run them on, uh, like in public cloud, the, like the component capacity management and be smart about when to launch, when to start VMs, when to turn them off, that whole mechanism is extremely important in public cloud. And sh it should be like, extreme simple to use. If it's not simple, then it will cost you a lot of money in public cloud. Like on-prem, this capacity management, when to power on, power off machines uh, based on like demand is less important because you already spend your money on like HPE hardware with Nutanix software. And that's like, I, I don't care if that machine is running or not. The machine is already uh, like someone paid for that machine, right? In public cloud, I do care because if the machine is not being used for X, Y, Z amount of time, 
that's just waste of money. A waste of money is like I'd rather have a nice a nice drink for that money, and like the customer as well, than just give the money to Amazon, Google, or uh, uh, or uh, or Microsoft. So yeah, right. So capacity management is super important, and every every proper DAS solution should have sophisticated desktop as a service, uh, sophisticated capacity management, but also analytics attached to, to, attached to that. And also insights in actual usage from a billing perspective. That's why, for instance, Frame integrates with Beam, which is able to give insights and usage uh, like cost control and governments. So. And one of the, you gave me a use case of, of a real customer out there that's using Frame for what I thought was probably the, the worst possible use case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember yet, exactly, yeah. Yeah, you so. Talk about that. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. So this customer one, they, they are like in media and entertainment, and they have petabytes of data in public cloud. They use S3 object-based store, that's where they store the like media files, and they wanna use, and are using frame uh, different customers, some of them are still in the development, like investigation phase, and some of them are in the running phase. They want to use Frame, uh, now using Frame to run, for instance, Adobe Pro, Premiere Pro, uh, to just open these files, even straight from S3, there are options to, to do that, and open and edit these files, like pre-editing, on the go. So the contractors can use their own machine, fire up the browser, log in with modern identity, launch Adobe Premiere Pro, do pre-editing, um, all in cloud, because the data is already in cloud, and this customer and this set of customers want to run these apps close to where the data is. They have projects, uh, maybe maybe news, TV shows, and they uh, they also have seasonality. They want to use multiple cloud locations because people travel all over the place. These are really good examples where desktop as a service, because this customer doesn't want to focus on the like infrastructure side of uh, like quote quote VDI and just want to run apps and desktops as a service in multiple cloud locations close to where the data is um, want to use just a browser on the endpoint run high-end graphics resource intensive applications and yeah, frame is really well suited for, suited for for that so they're doing video editing mm -hmm. with desktop as a service wow that's it's impressive Yep. Uh, so the performance has got to be fantastic. I mean, for anyone who wants to just say watch yeah. a video, I, I don't even want to edit the video. I just want to be able to watch a video. Um, well, sometimes, on my... to be honest, sometimes the performance is not great. And let me explain why. For instance, in uh, like South America, the amount of public cloud options are not so great. There's an, like both Azure, uh, Amazon, Google, they have data centers in, for instance, Brazil, and that's that's it. Or if if you're in like um, like Africa, you're also limited. Like limited by network latency, sometimes bandwidth. The latency will kill user experience. So even if I have like a, a 10 gig network connection, but my latency is 10 seconds, that <laughs> as a crazy example, that will kill user experience. So sometimes these use cases don't fly, don't work well, because this infrastructure is too far away from where the user is. Every vendor in our space. A frame remoting protocol, PC over IP, Blast, HDX, RDP, all will have the same issue. Somewhere in time will break when latency is too high or bandwidth is too low. And that's the beauty of when the DAS platform can also support on-prem like co-location or hosted scenario, especially when, well, maybe public cloud doesn't work well enough because there is no cloud region or maybe you don't have the right instance types or these instance types don't perform as you need or the, as you expect. So. There are, it's good to have options, both public cloud options and on-prem options. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the point. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and say, I like the on-prem option as well because, yeah, I mean, in my use case, I had a lot of, uh, it was a corporate headquarters, and I had lots of local uh, users who, who could consume these desktops. But then there was also a, a sales force, a large sales force that traveled with laptops um, and they needed access to their desktops remotely. And so it sounds like this would work, you know, really well in that case, especially if the data is already on premises. Yeah. So we started the like conversation with why and understand the use case. If you don't know the answer on why, if you don't know the use case, then you are on slippery, you call it slope, something like that, slippery <laughs> slope to, because 
then VDI might suck because it doesn't meet the expectations. And that's why it's not, not rocket science. That's why it's so important to understand the, the complete picture. Okay. And, have options. and I have options to use multiple cloud providers where, where it applies or use public cloud or on-prem, depending where the data is, depending what kind of infrastructure resources you can use, depending on the performance characteristics I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Yeah, so let's go down a little bit deeper and talk about specifically the difference between VDI and desktop as a service. Yep, let's do that. So, I, I, for now, I call it enterprise VDI. The term enterprise is always a little bit, to be honest, challenging because enterprise in US means something else as enterprise in Italy, where I am right now, or enterprise in Netherlands. But call it like business VDI, VDI being used by organizations in general, small organizations or large organizations and compare that with desktop as a service. I don't see it as like black and white or yes or no or zero or one. It is, that's not my, the purpose of this particular slide. But I, what I tried, and if you have feedback, always great uh, to get feedback, uh, what your view is. This is my view on like enterprise VDI, business VDI with the characteristics. So on-prem, often co-location, often local region or maybe one or two other regions, fixed capacity, uh, it's mature, it's very capex intensive, defined use case, um, fixed stability, low elasticity, because elasticity means why well, you need to buy new hardware and rack and stack and all these things. And on the other side is desktop as a service, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, multi-region, pay for use, OPEX driven, less capex driven or no capex driven, um, extreme fast time to market in the context of frame every week we have updates sometimes bug fixes uh, uh, sometimes new functions so every week we just add new things to the platform um, so highly innovative um, availability and agility by design and also elastic by design both up and down not only up like elastic up but also like up and down so to support seasonality as example so what i see happening is that Vendors in, who are born in the enterprise VDI space on the left side are trying to, and not only trying, but also moving to the as a service uh, space and pick up the components from as a service. And vendors like Nitanix Frame who are born in, in the as a service world will pick the components where it applies to have from the, from the left hand side, from the enterprise VDI. So that frame is a service, but we can use on premises co location as an example. And we can use local region as I just explained. And I, I personally believe that it is easier to, to, to use an as-a-service solution and connect it to on-premises than the other way around, to use a VDI solution and make it multi-cloud, multi-tenant, multi-region, uh, API-driven, simple to use, things like that. So it's not pros or cons, it's just what, understand what the customer demand is. Some customers really are really happy with, um, for instance, longer time to market. A um, couple of months ago, I was um, engaged with a large financial, 100,000 plus concurrent users, and it takes them a complete year to validate a change. Imagine your platform is moving much faster. That is stress in the, in the system, that's stress in the process. So some customers are extremely well fitted for the left side. Other customers are extremely well fitted for a more, more flexible uh, scenario. And over time, it will, it will balance out. Um, the frame will use more and more enterprise VDI uh, functions and features and, uh, and capabilities. And probably other vendors in this space will do the same, but then from left to right. So it's not good or bad. It's more like what is the customer de demand and what fits better left or right, or what components from left or right are appealing to the customer. And then you pick the, the vendor, you pick the solution based on like these kind of uh, conversations. That's what I do. And then like my simple, like theory is that it's not like black or white, it's not on or off or yes or no or good or bad or something like that. It often is like a combination of, of both worlds. Why I joined Frame two years ago, or two, a little more, actually two, more than two years, like almost two, two and a half years ago, is that I believe in desktop as a service. It makes life easy for many of us and also believe in the hybrid world. It's not that public cloud or on-prem. I believe in the right use case for the right and the right platform for the right uh, right use case. And if the control plane can support both, which 
frame can is a really great fit. Some people might say, or actually might think or will say, well, Nutanix acquired frame, that's why we, we as Nutanix uh, frame team um, developed on-prem support. That is not the case. When I joined frame um, like close to like, maybe three years ago, I've seen a prototype where we are able to run frame on-prem. Even before this conversation happened, conversation with Nutanix and frame happened about acquisition. So why is that? Because there are use cases where public cloud is not the best fit. Maybe legal, maybe cost, maybe performance, maybe availability, as I explained, uh, explained earlier. Maybe the data is on-prem and it performs better when the application is also running on-prem. So there can be many reasons why public cloud or on-prem, one or the other, is a better fit. That's why it's important to have both options. If you can have the control plane, the same control plane and the same management skills and the same tools to manage both on-prem or cloud or clouds, then I think we are in a, in a great position. So you know, we've been talking about VDI and desktop as a service, how they're the same and, and how they're different in many ways. Um, so let, now let's talk a little bit more about Nutanix specifically. Mm -hmm. Why should I look at Nutanix for VDI and desktop as a service? And that's one of the things I like is that Nutanix does both. You're not saying that, that VDI is dead nope. <laughs> and, and desktops as a service is the new option. You're okay. saying, hey, these are both great choices and Nutanix can provide great um, solutions for either one, whichever one fits, you know, your use case. But yeah. why Nutanix? Yeah, good, good question. So this is what what we prepped, right? So why Nutanix? Because like end user computing, virtual desktops are in Nutanix DNA. When our company started roughly ten years ago, the first big type of use case and workload was VDI, and VDI not only like VDI, but VDI Zen apps and desktop. Uh, VMware Horizon, like this whole like virtual desktop, virtual client computing industry. Um, as of today, close to one, close to 25% of the workloads running on Nutanix is like quote VDI related, like end user computing related. So really, we really understand this um, this industry well. We built very specific functions um, which benefit for, for, for which which are, which are really beneficial for for VDI, like data locality. Um, a strong Citrix integration, um, like these kind of topics are are part of the core platform, like the Nutanix hyperconverged platform for VDI. So Citrix can benefit from that, VMware can benefit from that, and many customers, large like extreme large deployments in the world, are using Nutanix hyperconverged infrastructure to run Citrix or VMware workloads on top of that. That's the like the left left side of the of the story. Um, hyperconverged as a core building block for data center is an important building block for end user computing because it is extremely scalable. I can just add new blocks and with each new block, I add more performance, more capacity uh, to that building block. Um, it, it makes the like data center extreme simple because that is almost like Nutanix's nick, their nickname, our nickname, second name, make things simple, simplify, hide complexity. That's what, what hyperconverge and Nutanix in general is, is all about. On the right side, on the right hand side is desktop as a service. So, if imagine you want to run the workload machines on premises, you can use Nutanix, as I explained, core building blocks to use Citrix Cloud or Xi Frame, like Frame workload machines on premises, but fully orchestrated and brokered by Citrix Cloud or or Xi Frame. And if you want to run not on prem for whatever reason, there can be very good reasons for that. Then you can use, and we, and we propose Xi Frame. We propose Frame to run fully, like in public cloud as, as well. So there is always it always starts with the question why, why, why VDI, why desktop as a service, what is the what's the current estate? If customers are using Citrix today, and many are using Citrix today, and they're happy with that. Great, let's continue and see if we can optimize the underlying infrastructure with Nutanix uh, uh, core and Nutanix essential solution. If a customer wants to move into the public cloud direction, we have a great story as well with, with Frame. So it's great to have options in our sort of toolbox to support customers with the questions they, uh, they have. Um, and I see, like, is there, sometimes people say, well, there's an Frame will be the new Citrix or Frame will be the new uh, VMware. 
I don't know. Like, and I'm like, I don't know. And I'm I'm part of the frame team. It, the starting point is different. Sometimes functionality is different. Features are different. Sometimes there's overlap. So yeah, sometimes there is friction. But more often there's also different use cases with different solutions. So in both type of approaches, I think we are really well positioned with hyperconverged and core building blocks for data center. And working close to close with that with Citrix and, and VMware and also in the public cloud with uh, with frame or with frame and workload machines on premises using uh, using Nutanix. So yeah, good to have options. Yeah, it's always good to have options. I mean, just like like Batman doesn't have just one tool in his tool belt. He's got all different sorts of tools in the tool belt. Um, so desktop as a service, it sounds like it, it definitely makes VDI easier, though. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm hearing is the over overarching theme of the difference between VDI and desktop as a service. So how does Frame make desktop as a service easier? Yeah. Um, there are like five like five steps. Um, the beauty is that if you use test drive or startup PC, you can just follow these steps. So in the middle you see the frame the frame logo. That's the control plane, that's a broker, that's a frame service. That's a, that's the platform we operate. So frame is not software you download and install yourself. Frame is a service you consume. And one of the the first thing you will do is you pick the infrastructure you want to use and connect that infrastructure to the frame account created for you. And in that, like the, the first topic is also the conversation, do I want to use public clouds or public cloud or on-prem? That's part of that, that one. That's more like a sort of consulting type of engagement, but you pick the infrastructure you want to use or you use the infrastructure you already, already have. And that's like the first step. The second step is you connect your identity system like Azure AD or Ping or Okta or Google or SAML based OAuth based identity systems. You connect that system to the frame account which is created. And the third step is you, but the first and the second step done done. That means that actually the frame tenant, your frame tenant in maybe on premises or maybe in region West Europe is up and running. And now you as the customer or the partner um, are in, is in a driver's seat to onboard your own applications. Maybe you remember that we have like three layers with a blue line and above the blue line states you because the customer, the partner is responsible for bringing their own applications. They can install them manually, automatically, they can use different tools, but they are responsible to onboard these apps. And inside the Windows machine where you install your applications, inside this master machine, we call it sandbox, inside your gold template, give it a friendly name, there's a frame agent running in that master machine. And the frame agent will recognize if you install new applications and will ask a question, do you want to onboard this application? If you say yes, then the frame system knows, the frame control plane knows, hey, customer ABC has installed application and now you can use that system to uh, provide access through a launchpad, through a web interface to different users. So imagine you have installed, uh, like in this example, uh, Word and PowerPoint, uh, Word and, and Photoshop. System recognizes Word, Word is installed, Photoshop is installed. Now you can create launch pads, even multiple launch pads, and define maybe a designer launch pad and a sales launch pad, and attach people from the identity system, as mentioned in point two, to that launch pad. And then you can just launch the apps by using a browser on, on, on your endpoint. If apps are great, but apps without data very often is not really valuable. So it's the question, where is my data? Where are the files or where's my data systems the application will use? And there's a variety of options. Maybe you have backend services like Oracle or SQL or other database services. Maybe you have file server or file services. Maybe use cloud storage. All these options I just described are common options and you want to connect them. So we have built into frame options to natively connect with OneDrive, Dropbox, Google, Google Drive, and Box. But we also, just by using, by nature of Windows, we can use like SMB, we can use Windows file services, we can use Panjura, Nozumi, or Azure file services to connect apps to, uh, to data. And then the fifth one is define capacity and invite users to, uh, to the launch pad. So we'll log, uh, end user login, click on desktop or app, or multiple apps, and then we'll just fire up these uh, these workload machines 
uh, maybe they are already running and if not, they're not running, they will power on automatically and just run these apps or desktops on any device somewhere in the world. So these are the five steps, infrastructure, identity system, onboard apps, make sure that apps can communicate with backend uh, systems or that apps can, can use data stored in public cloud storage, um, define capacity, invite users, good to go. And this can be done, as I mentioned earlier, in test drive. It, normally the test drive is two hours with a special code. It is two hours with GPUs. Um, yeah, just you start with three, four, and five because the system already is deployed on a public cloud platform. But just, for instance, install Google Earth, connect OneDrive or Dropbox, whatever the system is, and just see how things will work. You will be surprised that, indeed, it can be really made, made really simple. That's what you see in that's what you're able to see in action. I like that use case, Google Earth. I might have to actually try that myself because, I mean, Google Earth doesn't work so great on my my oldish uh, iPad. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of lag. So I'm very curious to see how Google Earth would perform, you know, in a desktop on cloud. Interesting is also like we focus really today on browser. And for many of the peers, friends, Competitors, give it a give it a friendly name. The browser is always the backup plan, like Plan B. But for Frame, it's always like the major like entry point to access apps and desktops. That's why we spend so much engineering time in making sure that the browser experience is so great. And with high-end graphics, cut and paste, microphone, play audio playback, high fidelity audio, like, like all these things combined, also through browser. Um, doesn't mean that the browser is how do you call it, suitable for every use case. The browser also has its downsides. For instance, if I want to use a smart card, the browser doesn't give me access to that smart card. So that's something we are, we are, I would say solving. We are, we are building something else to solve that particular use case. Or maybe better multi-monitor support through a browser sometimes is challenging because if I, imagine I have two monitors, I want to use multi-monitor. What happens with a browser, a second tab will open in, for instance, my Chrome browser, and then the user needs to drag one tab to left and the other tab to right. Will it work? Yes, it works. Is it user-friendly? Well, can be improved. That's why we will uh, deliver a solution for that pretty, uh, pretty soon. So browser, yeah. and, and that pretty soon means we still will use the HTML5 technology we developed and are developing, but um, yeah, do smart things with that, uh, with that terminal using local resources. Of the, of the of the endpoint itself. I like how you all are just always innovating. I mean, when there's a challenge, you come up with some a, a new solution uh, mm -hmm. that's just on the horizon. So, I mean, desktop as a service, it sounds like it's definitely going to make VDI easier. But it, are there still any challenges with desktop as a service? Uh, what's the hard part? And do you have any tips for us? Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, what is like what is challenging uh, more generic is is managing expectations it's always challenging because that's communication and communication is not always easy and if you have different languages and different cultures or like i'm in it and i like this is what this is how i operate it's not always easy to, to manage these expectations so really find time and spend time in managing expectations is is key what is hard with das as with vdi our apps what is hard with das is network, as I just described, you still have need to have a network connection to operate. And without network, no VDI and no DAS. And well, that is, if I travel, that is a use case. So as part of the total end user computing strategy, that, that use case should be part of your strategy. And so it's sometimes DAS and VDI is not the answer. And that's totally fine. If you, if you know what the answer is, then you can find the right tool and the right solution to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, what is challenging is user experience monitoring. Sometimes you want to use different tools, maybe tools you've never seen before. That takes time to find these tools. I mentioned a couple of uh, vendors of great tools all, already. Um, sometimes it's hard to size, especially, for instance, when Microsoft, especially when Intel finds all kinds of security bugs, which will impact sizing, right? because Windows 10 sizing today is different than like Windows and even like half a year or a year ago, right, because of this uh, Spectre, Melton, and other security patches for, for the OS that has impact in sizing. That's, that's not easy. That's also an art to understand that sizing. Um, 
what else? Understanding cloud services, um, service limits. If I ask a question to a customer, like, hey, customer says, okay, I'm going to use Frame on Azure. And if I ask a question, is there someone in the organization who understands the, like the, the who understands service limits? And if no one is capable to understand what service limits means, and service li limits means every, ten, every subscription, every Azure GCP AWS subscription has service limits. It means I can, for instance, spin up only 50 GPU-based VMs because my service is limited to 50. If I don't know about service limits and I don't know how to change that or how to investigate that, that for me is a sign that maybe it's good to spend a little bit more time on Azure AWS GCP education before the customer is tiptoeing into public cloud services, as an example. Or if I ask, is someone able to do um, v uh, a VNet peering or a VPN gateway setup in public cloud? And if they have no clue, well, nothing, nothing wrong with that, but it's, an, it's a sign like, okay, this is, it's good to spend more time with the customer and ed ed educating them about the basics of cl cloud services, like I just explained. So these are like the, the hard parts. And sometimes also the hard part is, um, is this example. So the hard part can be, imagine you're really deep into VDI. And my, like my personal background and colleagues of mine are in that space. Change sometimes is hard. Sometimes people stick with what they know, or often people stick with what they know. But if I explain, well, over, over time, like how many, how many Exchange diehard consultants do we still have? Many of them shifted from Exchange to Office 365 cloud consultant. That's a shift happening, like, and it's still happening right now. It means that the art of designing Microsoft Exchange is less relevant when you use Office 365 because Office 365 is service. So you move from software to service. That is also happening on the VDI side. It's an art, but slowly, or well, sometimes not slowly, but it's happening that VDI is, in a, is heading in the direction of desktop as a service. Maybe not for all use cases, maybe not for everyone, but step by step, that's why I, that's why I see DAS is, uh, like is, being, is being used. So if you're in the VDI zone and you think, well, VDI will be the solution for the next like 10 years and DAS will never make it, maybe look, look, in, look in the mirror and say, well, what happened with Exchange? What happened with like identity systems? What happened with CRM? It cloud happens as a service happens. And that's also happening with, with, with like VDI to DAS. Why is, an, an example, why is Microsoft delivering soon a platform or a service called Windows Virtual Desktops? It's like desktop as a service. It's a control plane running in Azure, workload machines running in Azure. So it's not multi-cloud, not like multiple clouds, but it's still a control plane in, in Azure and workload machines in Azure. Why is Microsoft doing that? because there's custom in demand for that. People wanna have a simpler solution. People wanna run apps and desktop close where the data is. That's why Microsoft is delivering Windows Virtual Desktops. Microsoft wanna compete with Amazon Workspaces and AppStream. Microsoft wanna make Office 365 stronger because more and more people are using Office 365. All good reasons, part of this desktop as a service, like shift uh, from VDI or from, uh, from VDI to desktop as a service. So one of the key quotes that you said right there that I think is a, a good takeaway is cloud happens. I, I like that. And that's a good tie-in to our next topic here because, I mean, I would assume that the performance uh, of running a desktop in different public clouds is, is pretty much all the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I know you did some testing recently and that might not be the case. So yeah. what'd you find? Well, you quoted, I assume, <laughs> Sometimes assumption is the mother of all Fs, right? Right. Assume is not the right. It's not the answer I would like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Just making joke of that. So sorry about that, sir, David. So I like I did not assume, but I did some. I did run some tests, and this is just one example. So there is much more to 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 share. So what do you what you see here is I'm using, and this is in like independent of frame. What I just want to share. This applies to Citrix, applies to VMware, applies to Microsoft. Everyone who's using infrastructure as a service and want to run apps or desktops on that platform. So what I did, I um, installed IOMeter. 
IO meter, open source, like storage benchmarking, stress testing tool, and loaded a VDI profile. If you search for IO meter VDI profile, you will see a blog post. But the essence is like more writes. So 80% of the IOs are writes and 20% are reads. That's like the core. And it's also random writes, random reads. That's the like that's the core message of IO meter profile. And I run this test for um, let's see 600 seconds, so 10 minutes. What I'm using, I'm using Azure Standard SSD. I'm using AWS like EBS, and I'm using GCP storage solution. If I use this test, so single user, his machine using Windows OS, using IO meter, and on Azure Standard SSD, I roughly get officially 500 IOPS. This test is like close to 600 IOPS. If I do the same test on Amazon, I roughly get 3,000 IOPS. If I use the same test on GCP, the lower two um, um, diagrams, it first starts with like high, like high peak of IOPS, like sort of burst capacity, but also from a storage perspective, but it's like close to 16,000 IOPS. And sustained after 10 minutes, it's close to 4,000 IOPS. Why is this important? Because before, like storage is, an, you know, is not always the most important, but very often a very important like, component in user experience. Remember the days of your laptop with the spinning drives and you moved away from your dead laptop to an SSD? Well, welcome to storage world. And if, so if, the, if the storage performance is like okay-ish, then yeah, that's what you get. But if storage performance is not not great or is different than you expected, yeah, because what, that's what you described, I expect like great performance. Well, it depends what kind of storage types you use. So in Azure, you have four storage types. You have standard HDD, you have standard SSD, you have premium storage, and you have ultra premium storage. Standard HDD in Azure means latency is all over the place and IOPS is, is limited to 500 per disk. Standard SSD means Low latency and consistent, great, but IOPS are still quote limited, or throughput is lim is limited to for instance, five to five hundred uh, IOPS, and then you have premium storage, which is great, but premium storage is um, the the performance is increasing, but the capacity in is increasing. So the main question is, what kind of capacity do I need? Do I need five hundred twelve gigs of capacity for a VDI VM, or is maybe one hundred twenty gig fine enough? That has impact in the performance. And sometimes certain instance types are not, you cannot use certain instance types with, for instance, premium storage. Like the instance type we use a lot is an NV6, a Nico Victor 6 or NV24, an NVIDIA GPU-based machine. And that machine today can only use standard SSD or standard HDD, but standard SSD, not premium storage. So that means this storage characteristics, as you see right now, for the C drive, the drive where normally the applications are installed is the performance you'll get. Does it mean that it's not good? Well, I wouldn't say that. I have many customers using Azure today with Autodesk applications, high-performance computing applications, and they are fine with the performance. It really depends on what, you, what the application behavior is and what kind of storage characteristics is attached to that. But just doing like a more deep dive on this topic, and a similar topic is, is about GPUs. I didn't add that to this conversation, but it's an important topic to think about. Um, and that's why that's why I shared this info. It applies to Frame, it applies to Citrix, applies to Citrix Cloud on Azure, Citrix um, applies to VMware Cloud on Azure, like applies to everyone who's using Azure uh, or using AWS or using GCP uh, as, as an example. So it's, don't assume, don't assume that performance always will be great or don't assume that you will have all the options you will have or don't assume that um, capacity is always available or don't assume cost will be lower than you have today. Don't assume. That's maybe the like the core line here. Yeah, I like that. Don't assume. Very good advice. Uh, and I mean, storage has often been the killer of of many VDI implementations. I know. I mean, it's kind of always the Achilles heel. It, it's, VDI seems to work great until you know you get a lot of workloads on it. And that's that's, that's why Nutanix started ten years ago. A week because Nutanix like hyperconverged is okay. Let's do a skill out high performance storage system, which has direct impact in great user experience. So to, de to de-sockify VDI and DAS, storage and storage performance and storage scalability, a low latency and consistent performance are all super important in VDI and DAS. Absolutely, absolutely. So I know we're starting to run out of time here. Uh, just a few more you know, questions before we announce that uh, demo 
uh, key, special access key that you can get uh, yep. that Ruben's going to provide here. So, I mean, what's the key takeaway here, Ruben? Yeah. Let me think about it briefly. So the key takeaway for me is transition to cloud is happening, which means VDI to DAS, which means great to have options like Nutanix Frame, and I truly believe that we are in the in the best position to so to to support desktop as a service with the strength to support both on-prem and public cloud workloads and so das is maybe for some people new um great but spend time uh, educate yourself in maybe the new world of desktop as a service and ask yourself hey how can i use desktop as a service what kind of use cases to benefit of desktop as a service what that's 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 the key takeaway and your key takeaway is don't assume, as, as I described, don't assume that public cloud is like the, the best thing since, the best thing ever. It is in many cases. That's why this control plane is a public cloud service. But the workload machines sometimes work great on public cloud, sometimes not so great. And it's great to understand the why and understand the options you have. Um, and at the end, the desktop as a service is made, VDI made simple. And many customers and customers uh, partners see the benefit of that and investigate options and hopefully this this talk this uh, presentation this conversation helps with uh, with your with your quest to find the best das solution for your your customers or if you're the end customer take a look at uh, Nutanix frame and uh, yeah, convince that you will see a simple to consume simple to use uh, solution with powerful elements identity cloud storage multi-cloud on-prem support uh, to uh, to consume i like that yeah not all cloud services are the same uh don't assume anything you know do your homework and you know yep. don't just believe the the hype in the news or whatever that everybody's jumping on the bandwagon to do one yep. thing you know learn about your uh your end user you know requirements and your company's needs and where the data is and yep. do your homework uh, all, all great advice so if, if DAS is not the right fit, that might ha might be the case, right? And VDI is a, is a best fit. Then ask yourself, hey, how can I optimize my my core platform to make VDI better or to make VDI great? And that's what I explained earlier. That's why Nutanix, the core platform, uh, kicks in really well. Uh, so that's also a key takeaway, but more on the like, quote, traditional VDI uh, side of things. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yep. And so. I know the audience would like to know how to access Frame and give it a try for themselves. Mm -hmm. Tell us yeah. how we do it. <laughs> Go to Nutanix.com slash Frame. Um, you can see in the, like there's a blue, blue text, like request code. I already requested. That's the code FM19GPU. So you can type in the code. So if you go to... Uh, do you have a test drive code? You see it on the, on the screen, click here. That's where you can enter this FM19 GPU, and that will unlock the test drive to use NVIDIA GPUs. You can select the data center you want to use. Maybe you're listening in from US or from Asia or from Europe. You can select the data center you want to use. There's a test drive getting started guide. You see it in the text in blue as well, which will help you through, help you through the, like the main core uh, concepts of, uh, of frame. Um, like onboarding apps, building launch paths, defining capacity, using utility service, connecting cloud storage, firing up applications, like all these, I would say, basic uh, basic things are part of that uh, getting started guide as well. Very nice. And I just put that URL and the code in the chat box for everyone right. out there. If you want to just click on that URL, that'll take you directly to the website and then enter that code to yep. sign up and try frame for yourself. So test drive is really like an isolated environment. You can see the admin experience and user experience, but it will be limited to two hours. That's and you don't need to pay for the infrastructure. It's, it's on our cost. If you need, if you have different needs, maybe you want to do a PUC or a pilot, or maybe like a longer test drive. Just reach out to to me. Um, email address was in the is in the deck, uh, and also at the end you will see my email address, first name dot last name at nutanix.com, and I'm happy to uh, to help. Um, the process, uh, you, you receive an email. When you start a process, you will receive, receive an email. Um, then you click on the like, get, start a process, and then you will receive a second email. For some reason, if you are 
if your spam filter is really tight, that email sometimes ends up in clutter or uh, spam folder. So take a look during that process in your spam or clutter folder as well. Because if you start the process, that will then will, the two hours will uh, will start from from a test drive perspective. But a great way to experience frame yourself. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I need to try this out for myself as well. Uh, so we have just a little bit of time for uh, just a few questions. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, Michael's asking, uh, what about dual monitor support? Is that available today or on the horizon? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the name horizon, but uh, all jokes aside. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> no, all jokes aside. <laughs> um, so, so dual monitor today is possible, but not great. And that's what I described earlier, because today we use the browser. And when I enable multi-monitor, the user experience is not great. Very soon, we'll, we'll make a native app available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. And that native app, the engine of the app is, is a browser. It's a browser engine. And it will unlock functionality the browser itself cannot do or is really tough to do. So one cannot expose too much, but I already gave a hint what will happen very soon. So you will see a native app. I wouldn't call it clients because it's not like a typical client you will see. And the engine of this native app will be like a browser engine. If you look at Chrome, the Chrome browser, the engine of Chrome or the, or the engine of Microsoft Edge, that, that type of engine is will we'll use for this native app. And this native app will be for Windows, Mac, and Linux as a first launch, and then we'll see what will happen. And that will that native app will have its own roadmap. And one of the things on roadmap for sure is what you described multi monitor to make it make user experience much better for multi monitor with frame. And I saw that the sneak peek of the native app, and it's it's slick. I really love the user interface. Really cool looking application. Uh, another question here: Any tips for figuring out whether it's more cost effective to purchase on on prem equipment? versus running in the cloud. So any tips? Oh. I would say I, I, I'm happy to help with a sort of ROI, ROI calculator, but it's not really a fuzzy, I would say typical vendor ROI calculator. It's really like the default questions. What kind of, how many people do you want to use with apps? How many hours a day? Is it seasonality or like, uh, like stable? What kind of machines do I use? What kind of apps do I use? Like these type of, these type of questions, and based on the answer of these questions, like I can help, colleagues can help, this calculator uh, can help to determine if on-prem or public cloud makes more sense from a cost perspective. So it's, that's, the, that's the tip, do your, do your homework, or I'm happy to help you with the homework, that sounds a little bit strange, but I'm happy to help with that. Um, but understand what the usage pattern is, understand what kind of machines are being used, what kind of storage is important for these machines. Um, ask yourself, where's my data? And where is the data in the future? And these components combined combined will determine, hey, this public cloud is makes more sense to to on-prem. Just reach out to me. I'm happy to share some uh, some content uh, content there. The goal the goal of this this uh, chat was not to focus on that, but there is content available to to share. Excellent. Yeah, and I actually did a webinar with um, Steve Kaplan of yep. Nutanix, and he wrote a book called the the ROI Story. And if you go to Nutanix.com, you can download a free uh, copy of the book, a free ebook. Yep. Uh, it's a good book for analyzing cloud versus on-premises as well. Uh, another question here, does Windows 10 need optimization for VDI? And yep. if so, what are the most important changes? That's probably a whole webinar in itself. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's like a, a community project called VDI Like a Pro. I'm part of that team together with Christian and Mark uh, and many other community friends focusing on the same, what's the impact of optimizing Windows? And that's a huge impact. So yeah, is it important? Yes, if you de deploy VDI or DAS using Win 10, same story. You wanna, you wanna know how you can optimize Windows 10. And because normally Windows 10 is, these, well, is running on your laptop or your Ultrabook or okay, on, your, on your workstation or your PC. And you don't care if, it's, if all kinds of tasks are running at night or all kinds of things are blinking and blooping here and there. But in VDI, maybe, not maybe, you do care. You want to optimize that OS for sometimes maximum scalability. And that's, there are many tools to make it happen. There are many best practices. I spent a lot of time in that particular, with that particular topic, uh, like recently and in the past, to find, to find out best practices. So if you go to VDI like a pro, um, 
it's a VDI like a pro.com as a community blog post, a community website, you will see info about that. And many vendors, including Nutanix, uh, colleagues of mine like Case Bagerman and Sven and Jerry, and they spend like, like their primary J job is to find best practices, to write best practices, to write reference designs, also with this question in mind. So yeah, if you go to Nutanix.com, search for like VDI optimization with Citrix or with Horizon as an example, you will see great info for, for that. And that's like super important. Yep. Very nice. Very nice. I haven't heard of that website before. I'll definitely check that out myself. Um, it looks like we have run out of time. Uh, Ruben, I'm, I'm sorry. I think we could chat all day for, or at least for another hour probably. But uh, it's, it's been a really great session. Before we go, I want to announce the prize winner of the $300 Tango gift card. That's going out to Luke Stewart of Washington. Uh, congratulations, Luke Stewart of Washington. We'll reach out to you to deliver that gift card. Uh, and thank you, everyone else who joined today's event. And a special thank you to our speaker. Uh, thank you, Ruben, for being on the event today. Yeah, thanks for your time. And thanks for listening live or later. Thanks again for your time. And congrats, Luke. And thank you to Nutanix for supporting today's event as well. For more information, of course, visit Nutanix.com slash frame. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See you next time.